5-2 perpendicular and angle bisectors. Okay? I'm only talking about perpendicular bisectors today, though. Definition of perpendicular bisectors. We've seen this definition, I don't know how many times, maybe four, five, six times. Um, very, very important um, segment, line, or array that we're going to talk about throughout the rest of the year. So it's a line, a segment, or array that is perpendicular to another segment at that other segment's midpoint. It's good to remember that segments are the only thing that can be bisected. Okay, so a line can never have a bisector. A line can never have a perpendicular bisector. A line never has a beginning and end, right? They go on forever. So if there's never a beginning and an end, there's no way for me to find a distance. And then there, if I can't find a distance, there's no way I can divide it by two to find the midpoint, right? So there's... There is no midpoint for a line, but uh, and hopefully that then allows us to remind ourselves that perpendicular bisectors then only exist for segments. You can only bisect a segment. Red. No, nah, blue stuff is gross. Any blue, any blue stuff is disgusting to drink or eat. No, it's gross. I like watermelon, strawberry, and apple flavored things. I don't, I don't like watermelon like candy. I like watermelon, but I like watermelon candy. What about the watermelon cheesecake? Yeah, about the price. I have watermelon cheesecake. You know how to fix that? Just stop brushing your teeth. That's a good idea. All right. Here we go. What this statement is saying, this, 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 um, Applet is going to show us the main uh, theorem that is encapsulated inside uh, the use of the, the perpendicular bisector. Okay, so the definition of perpendicular bisector says that it has to pass through a segment's midpoint. So would you guys agree that C is a midpoint? No matter where I put A or B, uh, C is developing two segments that are the same length. Um, so we have that idea. Now, I need a line, a ray, or a segment that is perpendicular to that blue one. So let's just do this. So that black line is then the perpendicular bisector. And to uh, convince us of that with angle measurements, we can look at B to C to D, and that's right angle, right? Now, any portion of that line, as long as it passes through C, is also considered a perpendicular bisector. So if I were to um, just do that red segment, is that red segment a perpendicular bisector? Yes. Is the blue segment a perpendicular bisector? No, is the blue one per is the blue one perpendicular to the red one? Yes, is it bisecting the red one? No. Okay. Uh, could that happen eventually at some point? Yeah. If I stretch that, maybe that's now a perpendicular bisector, right? Maybe the blue one is now a per perpendicular bisector of, of DE. Um, but in general, we don't know. Is that still a perpendicular bisector? Is DE a perpendicular bisector? Why not? Doesn't pass through C, right? That go through C. Uh, is um, is that ray a perpendicular bisector? Yep, passes through, right? Is it now a perpendicular bisector? Yep. Um, is here. Oh, I can't do it. Um, if I did this, I 
Is that right? A perpendicular bisect. No. So we all get the idea that it's got to pass through C, it's got to pass through the midpoint, and it's got to be perpendicular, right? All right. So now I'm going to ask you this. And this is where the main theorem for this section comes into play. If I go back to uh, that perpendicular bisect of that line, let's look at this point D. Let's move that point D around. It stays on that line, right? So we could say, we could phrase it that D is on the perpendicular bisector of AB. <coughs> D is on the perpendicular bisector of the blue line, the blue segment. What could you tell me, or what do you think you could tell me about that distance compared to that distance? It's the same. Why? I'm just going to have a reason, not just because. Okay, side angle side. Okay, uh, Alex is saying that that is congruent to that, right? That came through the, the knowledge that, that C was a midpoint, correct? You know that right angles are congruent to right angles, right? DC is congruent to itself, right? So those two triangles, triangle one and triangle two, are congruent by side, angle, side. Okay, now if they're congruent by side, angle, side, then by CPCTC, that segment there has to be congruent to that one, right? Does that make sense, everybody? Yep. Now, here's my question. Obviously, those triangles are different than those two triangles, right? But are those two triangles still congruent? Yep. Are the red dotted lines then still congruent? What about those triangles? Are they different? Are these triangles different than the ones I just had? Those triangles are different than this one, right? Yeah. Okay. But are the red lines still congruent? Yeah. If we go through, and it's all because of side angle side and CPCTC, if I ask you for the distance of those two red lines, or red segments, uh, we see no matter where D is, those values are equivalent. Okay, 5.8, 7.56, okay. Is that all right, everybody? So how do we write that? What we say in our theorem is that any point, okay, any point that is on a perpendicular bisector is equidistant from the endpoints of the segment getting bisected. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'll give you a minute to write that down. This theorem right here says so if a point is on the perpendicular bisector of a segment, then it is equidistant from the endpoints of the segment. Equidistant, equal prefix means equal, right? Distant refers to length. So it's that the equal lengths or same length, same distance, however you want to phrase it. Okay. Um, the converse of this theorem is there below. Uh, it is also true. And basically all that says, and it should be information that we currently already have a, a somewhat of a grasp for because of some other theorems we've talked about. But basically this says, if you have a point that is equidistant from two other points, you know that point is on the perpendicular bisector of the segment that those other two points created. Okay, and so it's just a converse uh, of that top theorem. Something I think, and I, I kind of shared this with the last class, would you guys agree that as you guys are writing notes, taking notes, it's a pain in the butt to write both those theorems down? Okay, it's time consuming, right? When you get to a college class and, you, and they, they're just talking and you're trying to write everything down that they're trying to say, and there, there's not uh, any wait time or downtime, okay? Uh, they're going to go at their pace and only their pace. If these two theorems needed to be recorded, wouldn't it be easier to write this theorem down and then say, Converse is true. That makes sense. So now I've, in, in, in that writing that first theorem and in that red phrase, I encapsulate both those things. Now, what do I have to be able to do? I have to know what the definition of a converse is, right? I have to know that that's flipping the if and then statement of uh, the the original conditional. So um, that 
idea, understanding your vocabulary might allow you to take better, more concise, quicker notes. Um, and, and you're going to find out eventually okay, that uh, sitting in maybe a, a, a college level course, the pace is much more brisk, it's a lot faster. Um, and if you're in a room with 300 people, you're probably not going to uh, maybe feel comfortable raising your hand and say, hey, can you stop on that slide for me? Uh, or uh, even if you do, you might not get addressed and they might not even call on you, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, <clears throat> Is this something we can understand? Okay. Um, I want to talk about the, the application of this, the purpose of uh, maybe understanding this theorem, okay, where we could use it. Do you guys know what civil engineers do? Yep. What? They do stuff like construction and like building. Okay. So, so, like yeah. so civil engineers will uh, do like city planning, city design, where they're uh, constructing roads. Um, now, now they don't do the physical construction; they do the planning, and then they hire a construction team um, to go out and actually do it. Does that make sense? Okay. But they're always they're they're part of the um, the process. They're uh, making decisions about that process. If something needs to change, it, it changes because the civil engineer says yes, we can change it. That's a, that, that's their uh, responsibility. Um, but it's like you know, they, they put in water lines or they, they structure water lines, they structure the planning for sewage lines, roads, uh, bridges, that kind of stuff, right? Um, and, and they can help with uh, like zoning and being able to uh, maybe provide uh, insight on where to place a uh, building. Okay, there are, there are groups, there are, there are mass analysis groups, okay, firms uh, that uh, as a business, will say we are we are mathematicians, and we will um, kind of outsource our knowledge and our abilities to different uh, areas of industry to to help you make decisions, to do the math for you so that you can make decisions. Um, if anybody's in sports, the the Browns have done this with trying to do draft picks and uh, how to pick uh, uh, players for the team. Okay, they hired a firm to say, okay, do the math uh, to see who is the the best person we should choose out of the draft. Okay. okay well, um, huh? You like that football league we didn't do? What? The draft thing. They call it draft. Draft day? Yeah. yeah. Well, but he doesn't hire a firm to do that. Like that's, I have watched that movie. It's a good movie. Um, but they did that. Okay. Um, and whether that panned out for them or not is another story. But there are firms that you can do that with. Does that make sense? So if I'm going to, uh, let's say that I'm a CEO of like Home Depot and I'm going to uh, put a building in Lima, I'm probably going to have somebody do some math for me to, re to help me realize where is the best location for that, based on the available locations. Does that make sense? I'm not just going to willy-nilly just pick a place, right? Because uh, it might not work, okay? Um, you, you can even see that sometimes that the math that they do do, uh, I said do do, um, that math is still sometimes um, going to create issues. There was a Home Depot. You guys know where the Home Depot is in Lima? Yeah. It's a vacant building now. Okay, it was there for about a year. Uh, it was right across from the mall. Um, now I'm assuming that they, they did a lot of research and, and math to, to pick that place. Um, it just didn't pan out. Okay, um, but we like to make decisions based off of math. Whether those decisions end up being negated later and then shown to be, you know, they didn't really work out, okay, if I go, uh, I use a, a lot of, I am using a math firm to say, yes, you should draft Johnny Manziel, and it doesn't work out, it is what it is, okay, uh, but we are better suited to make decisions based off of math than to make, base them off of a gut feeling or something like that, if that's your opinion. Um, when we talk about the civil engineer, his, his goal his, his responsibility right now is to help determine a location for a hospital, okay? Let's say in this county we have two heavily uh, concentrated populations, two dense populations. Let's say that one of those populations uh, is down here, okay, at point A, and let's say the other population is up here, and I'll call it point B, okay? I want to put a hospital 
so that it equally addresses the needs of A and B, equally addresses the, the needs of those two populations. Where would be the best place in regards to distance to place my hospital? Right in the middle, okay? So right in the middle, the math term for right in the middle would be what? On the midpoint, right? Okay, so that awesome out. Um, that's where we would put it if, huh? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I do that with brothers all the time. Never call me. Never call me DJ. Never well, you're his sister. <laughs> you're right. All right. So um, we would we would want to put it right there at the red dot, right? That's the midpoint of segment AB. That's the most optimal position. Now I'm going to say this. Let's say that there is a structure or something already there. Let's say that there's a giant lake right there, and I cannot I cannot put it there. So where is my next best option? I go up or down. How do I, how do I go up or down? What, and how would that be? What kind of line? Okay, so I'm going to find... I'm going to find the perpendicular bisector. Okay, so I just got to go through that point. It's got to be perpendicular. Okay, and now H, my hospital, has to be somewhere on that red line, right? Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, now where would be the optimal spot? Be kind of maybe on that shoreline, right? Or maybe up here, but up here I'm now in the question of whether I'm in the county or not, right? So maybe this is the best place for H. Does that make sense to everybody how we do that? That's the, that's the benefit of having that geometry principle. Now, here's my next question. Let's extend this a little bit. Let's say that we have a third population down here at C. Okay? What am I going to do? Nope, nope, nope. I do make a triangle. I'm not going to draw a whole triangle. But the idea is if I want to be equidistant from all three populations, Okay, I then need to make sure that if I do that, okay, where, if I wanted to be equidistant between C and B, where should my hospital be to be equidistant between C and B? On the middle of that line, right? So on that midpoint. Okay, but we still have the idea that we've got to be equidistant from A, right? So if I put my point there, yeah, it's between B and C, but it's not, it's not equidistant to A now, right? So what I do, anything that is on that blue line, anything that is on that blue line is going, because that's that blue line is the perpendicular bisector, right? Anything on that blue line is going to be equidistant from B and C, right? Does that make sense? So what happens with that blue line, that blue perpendicular bisector, and this red perpendicular bisector, what do they do? What do they do right here? They intersect. They cross, right? So that place where my cursor is, where they cross, that point is on the red perpendicular bisector, right? So it's equidistance from A and B. That point is also on the blue perpendicular bisector, right? So it is equidistance from B and C. So the argument here is that H to A, look at this, if, if, it's equid if H is equidistance from A and from B, we've got the distance H A equals HB, right? Does that make sense to everybody? If H is on the blue line, okay, so on this blue line here, isn't it equidistant from B and C? So HB is equal to HC. So what's that tell me? HA equals HB and HB equals HC. All three of those distances are equal, right? So where the hospital is, if I'm standing at the hospital, I can walk to uh, population A, population B, or population C, and it'd be the exact same distance. So now if I've got ambulances that are coming from those places, they all have to travel the same distance, right? Provided that we have roads that go straight to the hospital. Yes? What would you do if that 
like point where if we did a thing to like all of them, what would we do if that area was all the way? That's a good question. I don't know. Maybe you readjust uh, and make a, a another kind of triangle uh, to kind of address. I, I'm not sure what you would do if there was something already there. You you would probably move slightly away from that, and then you would end up being maybe a little bit closer to uh, C than you are from A and B. But that's the optimal position. Okay. Now obviously, in city planning, something might already be there, right? So we might have to adjust a little bit, but that gives us a starting point of where to go. Okay. So now. That leads us into what we want to talk about in Section 5.3. In Section 5.3, because look at this. What am I creating here when I connect these A, B, and Cs? I'm creating a triangle. Now, I didn't do this. I never created the perpendicular bisector of A to C. Would you agree that's maybe the midpoint? Would you agree that maybe that is the perpendicular bisector? Does it go through the same point right there that the other two are going through? Okay. So the idea is, when we find the three perpendicular bisectors of a triangle, three perpendicular bisectors of a triangle, they are said to be concurrent. Okay? When I tell you, when you say something, say something that is a valid statement, and I say, I concur. What does that mean? I agree. Okay? I concur means I agree. Okay? Um, so when we talk about lines concurring, okay, it means they're in agreement. Does that make sense? Well, the only time that lines can be in agreement, if they're different lines, if they're distinct lines, is where they cross. Does that make sense? Now, the other word that we've used for where lines cross is intersection, right? We use the word intersection for two lines. When we talk about three lines being in agreement, we don't use the word intersection very often. We use the word concur, or that they are concurrent. Does that make sense? So three or more lines that intersect at the same point are said to be concurrent. And that point in which they are concurrent at, that point H that we were talking about in the last picture, that's called the point of concurrency. Okay. The, I, I guess my best, because some people ask, why, why don't I just use the word intersect again? And my argument to that would be this. Those are three lines, right? Do they intersect? Yeah. Any two of those three lines intersect, right? Are they concurrent? No. Okay. If I look at... I know. If I look at those three lines, they concur, don't they? they they're concurrent. They're all intersect at the same point. Okay. Um, so that word just kind of distinguishes or differentiates the fact that we're talking about three lines all going through the same point, okay? Now, here's, here's what is, is really nice about this. In a triangle, we're going to be talking about a bunch of groupings of lines, okay? We'll talk about today, perpendicular bisectors. Tomorrow or the next day, the angle bisectors. Eventually, it'll be things called medians, um, and then altitudes. And there's always going to be clusters of three. All of those, when we're looking at clusters of three, are going to be concurrent, okay? Um, meaning that if all three of them are concurrent, then any two of them are going to intersect. Does that make sense? Let me give you this picture. <clears throat> if I look at the perpendicular bisector for BC, that's the perpendicular bisector for BC in that triangle, right? That's the perpendicular bisector for AB. That's the perpendicular bisector for AC, right? Do you see how they're all concurrent there at that red point? Okay. Are any two of them still going through that red point? Does that make sense? So that logic says we don't need to look at all three. When we're doing this or, or we're trying to uh, identify where this point's located, we don't need all three. We just need at least two of the, the perpendicular bisectors. Is that all right? That allows us to be, it cleans the picture up a little bit. Obviously, it'd be, it's, it's a lot nicer to just look at that picture than it is to look at that picture. Okay? Um, this point of concurrency. So these, are the, these lines here are our perpendicular bisectors. So those lines right there, perpendicular bisectors. Um, the point of concurrency is referred to as that word right there. 
circumcenter. All right, and I'm just going to put it out there right now for us because does it, does the name really signify the idea of center to us? No, no, in regards to its location right now, it doesn't, does it? Okay, center, you think it's going to be in the middle somewhere, right? The way we talk about center through the rest of everyday life and other, everything we ever talked about in geometry already, in math already, is that center should be the middle, right? Well, that's not in the middle of that triangle. So then we got to kind of question, why is it called that? Why is it called circumcenter, okay? Um, write down the definition. I'll, I'll put it up here. Circumcenter is the intersection or the point of concurrency for the angle bisector. Or sorry, segment bisectors, the perpendicular bisectors. Okay, so let me phrase that. This point, the, the, the circumcenter, is the point of concurrency for the perpendicular bisectors. And I want to talk about what kind of triangles we can deal with uh, in regards to our circumcenters and how that kind of changes the position of the circumcenter. And then we'll talk about the, the biggest fact um, that circumcenters provide us which is encapsulated inside that theorem right there. No. Huh? No. Kangaroos and bears and donkeys don't live together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why? Yeah, they should all be killing each other. They do. Yeah, but like, there shouldn't be like everyone hailing the lion to the lion. Why not? He's the king of the. No. That's just something we named him. Them. Isn't he the top predator? Yeah. So we named him based off of his. Presence is predatory skills. Top of the food chain. Then he would have probably gotten eaten. Rafiki cannot drop Simba. That's just not. It would have been a really short movie then, too. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, those are my daughter's favorites. All right, here we go. Um, so, circumcenter, what kind of triangle is this right here? Obtuse. Okay. So, for an obtuse triangle, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to kind of make all the, look at that point, that circumcenter point. Are these all obtuse triangles? Where is that circumcenter showing up? On the outside of the triangle, right? So, for an obtuse triangle, the circumcenter is always on the outside, okay? Now, let's look at this triangle. What kind of triangle is that? The right triangle. Where did the circumcenter show up? On the hypotenuse. On the triangle, okay? But better yet, on the hypotenuse. Where at on the hypotenuse? The midpoint, okay? And I'm not going to put the distances up there, but if I, if I ask for that distance and I ask for this distance, they're going to be identical. So you might want to write down that uh, circumcenter. These are all kind of recognition facts that um, we need to know based off some of the questions that we see in our homework. Um, and, and these facts that actually allow you to answer your homework questions that involve algebra a little bit easier um, if we know them for right triangles or obtuse triangles, that kind of thing. So we're going to have the midpoint of the hypotenuse. Is that all right? Okay. So Obtuse was on the outside. Right triangle is on the hypotenuse. Acute is going to be where? On the inside. Okay. Um, well, the only way I can make a 45 degree angle is if. We have to get a right triangle, right? Well, I guess not right triangle. Let's say. 
I mean, that's 45, it's going to be on the outside, right? Okay. Um, but for the right triangle, it's going to be, it's a 45, 45, 90 for the right triangle, correct? Um, all right, so here's a question. So you're asking if it was a, like equilateral? Um, I mean, that's going to be more centralized than what we've seen with any of the other ones. Okay, so that's kind of that's maybe the closest I can get to a, a 60, 60. That's kind of central, centralized, right? Um, now the question, like, why, why is it called a center right there if it's not even on the inside of the triangle? Here's the reason. Let's put it on the inside of the triangle first. I'm going to get rid of the blue lines. Once I have, once I have the perpendicular bisectors identifying my circumcenter, let's just erase them or uh, <clears throat> make them disappear for a little bit and still have that point, right? So that point is still the circumcenter. Now the definition uh, that we talk about a circumcenter, we say it's the point that is the intersection of perpendicular bisectors, right? Meaning that that point, using our theorem, that point should be equidistant from B and A prime, right? But shouldn't it also be equidistant from B and C prime? Or sorry, C? And shouldn't it be equidistant from C and A prime? Does that make sense to everybody? All right, so here's my question. What does that give us? If I do this, if I put in that segment right there, and I'm going to now rotate that segment around that thing, around that point, so it allows me to move this thing around. Okay? It makes a circle. But what's unique about that circle? It passes through all three vertices, right? Okay? That circle. That circle center is the circumcenter. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's where that word center comes from. Okay. That's why we call that point a center is because it's the center of this circle. Does anybody know the name for that circle? What kind of circle that is? Uh, oval is an ellipse. We use the word ellipse. And a circle and ellipse are uh, an ellipse is an elongated circle. Circumscribed circle. Okay. Uh, and it's because it's related to the, the triangle. Circumscribed, the word circum means circular, right? Circumference, right? It means the distance around a circle. Okay. Scribed, what scribed mean in English or history? Somebody that's writing, right? Or that you are writing, okay? Or you're drawing, okay? So a scribe is somebody that did recording of history, right? That's what you learn in, in, in maybe world history, right? Okay? Um, so when I say circumscribed, it's the circle that is scribed, in this case, around our triangle. Is that all right? Okay. So every single triangle has a circle that will go around it and touch all three vertices. Every single triangle has that, okay? Um, if I were to highlight that triangle, or sorry, that circle for every triangle, it would look like this. That is my circumscribed circle. Does that make sense? Now, as I move the triangle, is there still a circle that goes through all three vertices? No matter how I make that triangle, there is a circle that goes through them, right? And that circle center is found at the circumcenter. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, whenever we use the word circumscribed, uh, circumscribed, it means we're drawing on the outside of a figure. Okay. We're drawing a circle on the outside. Uh, me, and it also has the, the geometry context that the, the vertices have to be touching the circle. Okay. So this circle... Let me go back, okay? That circle is around the triangle, right? But we would not call it circumscribed because it doesn't touch all three vertices, okay? No matter what triangle you talk about, because any triangle you talk about is going to have three perpendicular bisectors, right? Those three perpendicular bisectors are going to be concurrent, 
And that means that point is always going to be equidistant from your three points, meaning that that distance is a radius of a circle that will pass through all three points. Is that all right? Okay. Why would I want to know that? I, let, let, let's say this. Let's say that I've got, okay, at my, at my house, okay, I've planted some flower beds. I've planted three of them. I've got one here, I've got one there, and I've got one here. Uh, begonias, petunias, and tulips. They don't flower at the same time, so I don't know why I do that, but okay. Um, so, so, yeah, some cough flower. Uh, I want to water them. I'm, I'm really lazy, okay? And I want to water them. I want to water them all at the same time, okay? Why is that impossible? I've got a sprinkler system. I got a sprinkler system that is radial, meaning that it's going to sprinkle in a circle, right? You've seen those sprinklers that sprinkle in a circle? Okay. So where would I put my sprinkler so it touches all three vertices? I'd put it at the circum center. Okay. And that, then when I turn my sprinkler on, that's going to make sure that all my gardens get watered with one sprinkler. That makes sense. Okay. But what if all your gardens are away? Well, then I got to get a better sprinkler. I don't know any sprinkler that's water. <laughs> I mean, why would I have a yard that's a mile wide? <laughs> so obviously there are things that you could do. There are things, like, there are variables that you could throw in here that, that blow that up, right, that make that impossible. Um, and you might even say, well, yeah, you're going to do that, but if, you're, if your um, sprinkler isn't going to, if you don't have water pressure enough to, to make that big circle, then you can't do that, right? You might say, well, um, you're wasting a lot of water then, right? I'm, I'm watering a lot of area there that is not uh, planted, and those are all valid arguments, but that would be maybe a way of being able to address three locations using one sprinkler. Yeah. No, what if you do is you could have, like, a hose going up and then, like, overflows on, like, three